Hey everyone, hope you're getting on just fine and I'm glad we're taking this journey together. In the next few lessons, we will be putting on our safari hats as we are going for a walk in the R environment. First, we're going to install R and R Studio together. Then we'll dive straight into R Studio and learn about its interface and how to make use of the main windows and tabs there. We will also talk about setting your working directory and getting additional help. I'm going to show you how to personalize the R Studio appearance so it fits your daily needs and personality best. After all, you cannot really do good work when you're constantly distracted by the typefaces and knowing squiggle on the G, right? Finally, we'll go over checking and setting your working directory. It will be a great section and you get to do a lot on your own computer so I'm going through things on mine. See you there! Hi and welcome back to R for Statistics and Data Science. Now, some of you have already had to brush heads with R before and may already have it installed on your devices, but for those of you who are just getting acquainted with the language and its shells, let me show you how to get R and R Studio onto your computers. R is available on the project website, the Comprehensive R Archive Network. Just type r-project.org in your preferred browser and follow the link to the list of mirrors you can download R from. If the cloud-based mirror, which is the top choice in the list, doesn't work for you, you can select a country-specific source and that's totally okay. Once you select your mirror, you will see three links for downloading R, depending on the operating system you're running. Follow the one that matches your OS, Linux, Macs or Windows. Then select Base or Install R for the first time. Both lead to the same page, so it doesn't really matter which one you go with. Next, once you are on the new page, click on the top link. It says Download R, the most current version number for Windows. This will start the download of a setup file. Once the download completes, run the program you just downloaded and that will take you through a familiar installation wizard. When the wizard completes the installation, you will have a shortcut to R in your start menu and R in your program files. Fantastic! Now, R is not a program or an application in its own right. It is a computer language, like Python and C and so on. To use R, you write commands in it and ask your device to interpret them and act on their instructions. You can use R's own terminal window to write and execute code, but the interface is not nearly enough for a pleasant and even productive experience. This is why today there is hardly a person who doesn't use R with the R Studio application. R Studio is an integrated development environment for R that makes writing programs in R a lot easier. It's a front end or a shell to R, if you will. To download R Studio for free, just go to your browser again and type www.rstudio.com. At the top of the page, there is a download prompt, so follow that. Choose the installer that works best for your platform and download the application. I'm running a Windows 10 computer, so that's the best option for me. Running the setup will again take you through a straightforward installation process and once it completes, you should be able to open RStudio. Now, bear in mind the installation order. Because RStudio is a front-end to R, you will only be able to use RStudio to its full capacity if you have R installed on your device already. You can use R without having RStudio, but not the other way around. Excellent. Okay, next. I will show you how to make your way through the RStudio environment. Ok everybody, let's talk about making our way through the RStudio GUI and learn how to take advantage of its functionality. A definite prerequisite for this lesson is having R and RStudio installed in your machine. If you still haven't done that and you're wondering how to, go back to the previous lesson and have a look, or consult the resources for that lecture. Ok, let's open RStudio now. The first thing you see when you open the application are the three main windows in RStudio. The console, the environment slash history pane and the files pane. The console is where you can issue commands and see your output. Don't think too much about the code we're using in this lesson. For now, it is just so we can see RStudio in work. 
We will learn about each line type in much more detail as the real coding lessons commence. So, the console. Let's do a simple print statement. I'm not much of a traditionalist, so instead of hello world, I will type greetings statisticians. So, if I type print greetings statisticians at the prompt and press enter, and there are no errors, R will return the output greetings statisticians on the next line. There are a few things to notice about working with the console. Often, when you start typing in commands, RStudio anticipates what you are trying to get at and offers you code completion options. If I type print again, it will suggest a bunch of calls I could be wanting to make. Code completion is available for functions, as well as function arguments, objects, data structures, and so on, but we are getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. If code completion doesn't show up automatically, you can call it by pressing tab. This feature comes in handy when working with a large number of objects or your dataset has too many variables and factors to remember them all. We are all human after all, we don't have infinite capacities. Okay, speaking of, let's move on to the environment tab. This is the workspace where all the objects, functions and data structures you create during your R session are stored. Let me show you. I will create a variable called vrbl and I will assign the number 9 to it. Again, don't worry about the code, a lesson on variables is coming up and we will discuss variable creation at length there. Notice that once I press enter and run the code, the vrbo variable appears in my environment. But the environment doesn't just list variables, it gives us a lot more information than that. Let's try creating a vector and a matrix so you don't have to take my word for it. Again, don't worry about the code, we'll learn how to do those things in detail later. Let's create the vector v1 and assign the numbers 1 to 10 to it. And let's also create a matrix m1 with the numbers from 1 to 10 in it. Nice! Now, if you look at the environment, you can see that our vector is an integer vector and that our matrix has two rows and five columns. You can also click on the dotted square here and look at the data in a spreadsheet form. We won't do that very often, but it's worth mentioning because we might end up using it once or twice. Finally, if you want to clean your environment, just click on the broom symbol. Then yes, and voila! Same goes for the console. You can clear that too using Ctrl plus L or Command plus L if you're on a Mac. Sweet! Now, RStudio has a history tab too. If you want to browse through all the commands you have entered so far during the session, this is the place to be. The history stores everything you've run, so it comes in handy when you want to search for a piece of code, but you have cleared your console like we did just now. A pretty central feature of our studio is its script pane. You won't see it until you start writing a new script, so let's do it now. You can create a script either by clicking on the plus file here or by hitting Ctrl, Shift and N. That's Command, Shift and N for Mac users. Scripts are super, super useful because they allow you to keep a record of your work and organize it in ways that make sense. Once you save a script, you can pick up your work where you left off the previous time. For people who come from different programming backgrounds, the R script is kind of like a .py file in Python or like the syntax in SPSS. Running a command in the script is only slightly different from doing it in the console. It goes like this. I will call two actions. I will create a result variable that gives me what 2 plus 3 is, and then I will call the print function to print a sentence, the result variable, and another sentence. To run a line in the script, I need to have either highlighted the line or have my cursor on it, like that. Then I must click on the Run button. I can also press Ctrl plus R or Command plus R to the same effect too. But again, this will only run either the line my cursor is on or what I have highlighted. And what about the output, where does that appear? The output still comes out in the console. Ok, to run the entire script or run from source, I need to have saved the script first and then click source. Notice that this executes the entire .r file, not just a line or two. Different ways suit different people. This is a kind of a pick your poison type of situation. Finally, let's quickly go over the files tab, then plots, packages and help. We're getting there, we are getting there. 
The Files tab shows all the files and folders in your workspace. If you haven't set a working directory, it uses a default. Setting a working directory is fairly easy. You go to the session, then set working directory, then you click choose and select the place you want to save your files to for the current session. If on the other hand you want to set a default working directory, go to tools, then global options and define your working directory there. Don't forget to hit apply and you're good to go. All right, next is the plots tab. Easy. If you make any visualizations, this is where the plots will appear. Our studio saves all visualizations iterations you make, so you can use the arrows here to browse through them. Packages is where all the packages you have in your library live. You can also install and update packages from here, like this. But we will primarily be using the console to do all of that. We are learning how to program after all. Finally, the help tab. In the help tab, you can find all the information you would need on a package or an object or a function in R, assuming you have internet connection, of course, or have previously downloaded the resources. Using help is super simple. Simply type help brackets and what you need help with in the brackets. For example, if I do help brackets print, I will get all the information about the print statement. Super helpful for learning R or looking up a function's argument structure. All right, that was a lot of information, but the best way to learn a new subject is to dive straight in and constantly be just the right amount of challenged, right? In this lesson, we will learn how to personalize our studio's appearance so it fits your daily needs. It'll be a quick one, so let's get started. To change the appearance in our studio, you need to go to Tools, then click on Global Options, like this, and select the Appearance tab. The most common reason for meddling with the appearance in RStudio is to reduce eye strain. If you're planning on working with R for hours on end, and if you're taking this course, I assume that this will be the case, then you will probably want the background to be a little bit darker so your eyes don't tire from the bright white light. You can change the default white theme through the editor theme. There is a little preview pane on the right so you can see how different themes affect the color of your code elements. And there are a lot of themes to choose from. I am personally using Solarize Dark because that works best for me, but another great one is Cobalt. It offers a lot of dynamic contrast and it's easy on the eyes. Again, this is something that depends entirely on your personal preferences, so play around with the options and choose what's best suited to you. You can also edit the font size, and I will go ahead and make it a little bit larger, so the recording is clearer and nobody would need to strain to see what's being typed in. There. That should do it. You can also select your own font as well. I happen to like Consolas, so that's what I'll go with. But if the default works for you, no worries leaving it that way. Right, that's it for personalizing your RStudio appearance. Next, we'll talk about packages and libraries, the coolest, coolest things about R. In the beginning, there was R, and R had a decent amount of functionality. Any aspiring data handler could download R, install it, and carry out her analyses and plotting and graphing. And everybody was happy. But then, the people with the big brains came. They started doing their more advanced or more specific analyses. Our code, they thought, could be useful for others. Let's put it in a package and make it available for everyone to use. And so they did. And so the Comprehensive R Archive Network, or CRAN, began to grow with each new package created and stored. That's the idea behind packages. They enable you to increase the functionality of R. And since R is an open source software, and every well-wishing big brainer can contribute their own package, the CRAN is a cornucopia of resources. Once you learn how to use it, you will be able to do a lot, a lot of data analysis, even without being a superstar programmer. Good thing we're about to lay the groundwork for both here. Okay, packages. As I mentioned, R has some base functions that come with the software so you can do certain things without needing a package. You can identify which those ones are during code completion by the word base next to them. However, many of the more useful R's functions don't come preloaded. They are kept in packages to be installed on top of R. 
And once loaded, you can use the functions from those packages in your own code. This gives you a huge capability boost, so let's learn how to install and load packages. There are two ways to install packages in RStudio, by using the menus or by using a command. If you already know the name of the package you need, the easiest way to install a package is by using the install.packages function in R. Let's say I wanted to install the ggplot2 package. All I need to do is type install packages, open parentheses, and notice that R automatically closes them for us, open quotation marks, again, automatically closed, and type the name of the package, ggplot2. And now we need to run the command line. This initiates a search for the package in the CRAN archive. When R finds it, it downloads it and installs it onto your computer. So all you need to do in the future, if you want to use the package, is just call it from your library. You can call a package from your library like this. Type library, open brackets, and the name of the package. This time, we're not using the quotation marks. Do you see that? Yeah. Notice also that running this does not give any obvious output. Effectively, this is just a message to R that we need to use the functions in the package so it should load it for us. And it should be done. If you want to check and make sure, just try to use a function from the package. For example, I can type ggplot. And what code completion suggests is a bunch of functions, all from the ggplot2 package, as the curly brackets indicate. That means that it's working. Okay, that's installing packages directly in the console, but we can also manage packages from RStudio's Packages tab. We mentioned that briefly in the RStudio GUI overview. You just go to the Packages tab, then click on the Install icon over here, type the name of the package you want, let's try something different, let's do tidyr, for example, and click Install. Done. And now, to load the package, take a look at your user library. This is where all the packages installed on this machine are listed. You just need to scroll down to the one that you want, in this case I want tidyr, and click on the little square on the left. See? We just told R to load the tidyr package and we can assume it did because the console didn't give us any sort of error messages. Okay, that's really cool. But what about if you don't really know what the package you need is? or what's the best package for a specific manipulation of your data. One option is to go into the CRAM project website, click on packages there, and browse. But bear in mind that this means browsing through thousands and thousands of packages. A better approach is to go to the CRAM task views, which lets you browse packages by subject area. Or, you can look at blogs dedicated to our announcements like ourbloggers.com. Either is a great way to learn about what's fashionable in packages right now and what has been the best in previous years. Okay, that's it for this lesson. As of the next one, we will start learning about objects and functions in R. It's going to be a great couple of lessons, so warm up your coding fingers, everybody. Okay, let's assume you haven't seen me type any commands in R neither in the console nor in the script. So, what can you do in R? How does R function? Well, you can use R as a calculator. Let's type 1 plus 2 in the console and hit enter. We get an output of 3. Fantastic! You can multiply, divide, subtract, and so on. Like this. We can also do multiple operations at once with R following the order of operations. For example, if I was to calculate 3 plus 3 times 7 minus 1, I would get 23. This is because multiplication comes first in order of operations, then division, but there's none of that here, then addition, and finally subtraction. Cool! You can also create a sequence of numbers by using the colon operator. Let's call the numbers from 12 to 42. Do you notice the numbers appearing in brackets in the output right here? Well, don't worry about them. They don't mean that much. They simply denote that the output line begins with the nth value. You can also use R to analyze time series and spatial distributions, as well as create mixed statistical models to handle hierarchical data structures.
But before we can even touch upon those things, let's learn about the building blocks of R that allow us to do all of those complicated operations. The objects and the functions. This is the stuff commands in R are made of. You create objects and assign values to them through functions. We will focus on objects in this lesson and we'll move on to functions and the future ones. So, what are objects? Well, objects are named data structures, inside of which you can store your data. You can then use the object name to call the information you have stored in it. An object can be a single digit, a character, a boolean value, or a whole sentence, a data frame, a list of data frames, matrices, vectors, and so on. Okay, let's create a few objects. The general formula for creating objects looks like this. Object name, less than, minus, value. Did you notice that I used a hashtag before writing the formula? This is because I do not want R to interpret what I wrote just now as executable code. The hashtag is special in this way. R ignores anything that comes after. So, we use it to add comments to our code and annotate it. Hashtag awesome. Okay, back to creating an object. Bob. This is what I'll call the object, so you can see that names can be as arbitrary as you want them to be. Less than, minus, and let's just assign to it the value of 7. Now Bob is in the working environment and holds the number 7. Whenever we call on Bob, R will replace it with what we stored inside of it. Like this. Bob times 2 equals 14. Not Bob Bob. Okay, so what about if we ask R to print Bob? Are we going to get the number 7 in the output or the letters B-O-B? What do you think? 7, of course. Okay, great. Whatever we would have done with the number 7, now we can do by simply calling Bob. Of course, this makes much more sense when the data stored in an object has multiple values. So, let's create a larger object. This time, let's call the object something a little bit more traditional, like A, and store a vector of numbers inside it. And now let's print A to see that we indeed have a vector of numbers in it. Fantastic! We have an object with 10 values in it, and we can do all the same operations we did with Bob. For example, A times 2. Notice that the multiplication is carried out element-wise, so it's 1 times 2, 2 times 2, 3 times 2, and so on, until you reach the end of A. This is a property of objects we will discuss in more detail in our vectors lesson, but it's important to keep it in mind. Okay, so that's the idea behind creating objects in R. But before we wrap it up, I want to make a quick note about naming objects. The convention is that R objects must begin with a small letter and can only contain letters, numbers, dots, and underscores. If you want to give your object a longer name, Individual words can be denoted by separating them with the dot or underscore or using a capital letter for every new word. I prefer not to use the underscore because it's considered in bad style, but to be honest, the choice of word separators is entirely personal. The important aspect of naming is being consistent, so if you use the dot, use the dot. Don't switch naming practices halfway through your code because that would make for difficult reading. All right, that's it for this lesson, everybody. In the next video, we will be building up our object knowledge by talking about data types. So, what does the pirate say? R, of course. Anybody who's serious about learning R needs to know this one. All right, so in the previous lesson, we learned about objects in R. Let's continue building on that knowledge. Objects store data. So, what are the types of data that they can store? First, let me introduce you to the concept of a vector. Vectors are a sequence of data elements that are of the same type. We will be using vectors often, so you'd better get used to them very, very quickly. You are actually well on your way already. Do you remember A and Bob? That's right, they were vectors. And since I already have Bob and A in my environment, I can quickly check if they are vectors by typing is.vector and passing their names in parentheses. Yes, both of them are indeed vectors. Great. So, R saves an array of numbers and single values as vectors. 
but this lesson is about data types, so let's see what types of data vectors can store. Generally, there are six types of vectors – integers, doubles, characters, logical, complex and raw. Just so you know, we won't really concern ourselves much with the latter two because they aren't widely applicable. Alright, integers. An integer is a whole number, any number that doesn't need anything after the decimal point. Making an integer vector is easy. A, the variable we created earlier, was an integer vector. It contained only whole numbers. Do you remember how we created it? We declared what A's first element should be, added a colon and defined its last element. And then we let R create an array of the numbers in between for us. Now let's learn something new. You can create a vector by typing C, which stands for concatenate, but you can think of it as combine, it's easier, and pass in parentheses the elements you want to combine in an object. So to create an integer vector I can type the following. Wait, but after I execute this, it says num in the environment. Huh, I will try to fix that by adding a capital L after each element. But why do we need a capital L? Wouldn't R know my number is an integer because it doesn't have digits after the decimal? Well, no. R is heavily used for data analysis and statistical manipulations, which don't really use integers all that often. So its default saving mode for numbers is into doubles, not integers. Doubles can store regular numbers, any number, large, small, positive, negative, with digits after the decimal or without. It's just easier for R that way because it assumes that most of the operations you do will either involve doubles or they will result in a double. And this is why you need the L. It is kind of like telling R, look R, I am certain I want to use integers here, ok? So don't just go ahead assuming I will be doing operations that require me to have saved my data into doubles. Here, I have even gone through the effort of adding this L for you. Let's make sure R understood what we meant by the way. To find out the type of an object, type type of and pass the name of the object in parentheses. Cool. R says our object is an integer and the data it stores are of the integer basic type. You can also see it up here in the environment too. Nice. This is what I wanted, so thanks R. One last thing to mention. R rewrites objects if they have the same name without asking for permission or issuing a warning. You may have noticed that we don't actually have two objects called int. It's just the one and we've been rewriting it. So. Be careful not to use the same names for different objects. If you have too many objects and you want to quickly check what their names are so you don't end up accidentally overwriting something, type ls followed by empty parentheses and R will list all the visible objects in your environment, like this. Ok, let's pause here everybody and we will pick up data types in the next lesson, where we're gonna talk about the character and the logical basic types in R. Fantastic work everybody, see you in the next lesson and may the code be with you. Alright everybody, in the previous lesson we learned about the integer type and the double type in R. Here we will tackle characters and logical vectors. Let's get to it. Characters. These are vectors that can store text data. You can save a single character into a character vector or longer strings by putting them in quotation marks, like this. Now if I check what basic type this car object is, R will tell me that it's a character, right? Right. Ok, let me do another example, see if you can figure out what's happening there. Car2, because I don't want R to overwrite my car object. And then the answer to life, the universe and everything is 42. Check its type. Character. Huh. But it has the number 42 in it, doesn't it? And didn't I say earlier that vectors can only store elements of the same basic type? Yes, I did. What's happening here then? Well, we put the number 42 in quotation marks. Effectively, we told R that it is actually a character string and not a numerical value. You see, the elements of a character vector are called strings, 
and they are not restricted to only being letters. You can define a string of numbers or symbols if you wish. Ok, let's take a look at logical variables now. Logical vectors store Boolean data, or true and false values. Our considers t and f to be shorthand for true and false, so they are interchangeable and you can use either or both. Let's create a logical vector and call it… let's call it Spock, after the ultimate superhero of logical reasoning, Mr. Spock from the Star Trek universe. Notice that I don't use quotation marks here and everything is in capital letters. This is a good moment to mention that R is a case-sensitive language and you want to be careful when calling objects or functions to match their casings. Let's check the type of Spock. It is logical. That sounds about right. Alright, as I mentioned, there are two more data types, complex and raw, but they are extremely unlikely to be used in data analysis. If you want to learn more about them for the sake of being thoroughly informed, feel free to consult the resources for this lesson or type into your script question mark is dot complex and run the line. This is the same as typing help and passing is dot complex in parentheses and both open up the help tab on the is dot complex function. You can do the same for the raw basic type too. Fantastic. Well, that's it for this lesson. You learned a lot about data types and some new functions. Try to recall their names and what they're used for. Next, we'll take a little break from long lessons and we'll talk about coercion rules in R. It's a light lesson, so see you there. Hey folks, welcome back to R for Statistics and Data Science. So far, we learned about the different data types R stores and now I need to quickly walk you through R's coercion rules. It is important to keep them in mind because if you don't, you may be in for some very, very unpleasant surprises. Do you recall the character vector from last time? It looked like this. And we used it as an example of how you can save things other than letters in a character vector, like numbers or symbols. As long as you place them in quotation marks, all elements will be stored as strings. Ok. But there is one more interesting thing about our number 42 here. Even if we had passed it without the quotes, R would have still gone ahead and saved it as a character because of the O vector elements must be of the same type rule. Let's make sure that that's the case though. I will delete the quotes here, run the line again and overwrite my car2 object. Let's check its type now. Character. We can also try printing it. Yep, 42 is printed in quotes, just like the rest of the character strings in char2. Alright, so what R did just now is called coercion. If a vector has even a single character string element in itself, all other elements will be converted to character strings too. The other way around doesn't really happen. Can you imagine why? Well, can you really imagine what a character translated to a numerical value will look like? We can probably think of something binary expressed in zeros and ones, but that would be impractical for the type of language R is, so it doesn't happen. In addition, if a vector only contains logical and numerical elements, all logicals will be coerced to numbers. Trues will become ones and falses will become zeros, like this. Cool. Ok, fantastic. So, to sum up, if a vector has a mix of character strings, logicals and numbers, coercion rules ensure everything is converted to character strings, right? And if there are only numbers and logical values, the logical values are converted to zeros and ones. That's easy enough to remember, isn't it? Ok everyone, in the previous lessons, we established that objects are fundamental to working with R and that they are in a committed relationship with functions. You create an object and assign values to them by using functions. In very general terms, you can think of the relationship between objects and functions as being defined by the statement the object X is created from the function Y. Which to a native R speaker looks like this, object less than minus function. By now, that should be a very familiar formula. 
functions are pretty simple. To run a function, you type the name of the function, followed by the data you want the function to operate on, in the brackets. For example, we can use the round function to round the number for us. We type round and then the number in parentheses. Run that and R rounds the number down to 2. We can get the mean for a series of numbers with the mean function. Or we can pass our variable a and get the mean of that. Now, what we pass into a function is called an argument. Functions can take many arguments and arguments of different types. When you're passing data, for example, it can be raw data, like our 1 to 10 case, an R object, like our A or Bob, or the result of another function, like this. Here, R knows to execute the innermost function first and work its way out. So, the mean of the numbers from 1 to 10 is 5.5, which, when rounded, is 6. Excellent! Ok, do you remember when I said earlier that objects and functions are defined by the sentence the object x is created by the function y? This is because we generally like to save the results of our functions into separate objects. The reason for this is actually twofold. On one hand, Saving the result of a function into an object of its own enables us to do even more operations with the result, and on the other hand, it makes our code easier to edit and to read. Ok, let's go back to the code we just wrote and save the result of the mean function into an object called b. I will run this line again, and now we have an object b in our environment. Now, if we want to see the result of the function, we only need to do what? Print b. There, let's do the same with the round function below. Save its result as c, and because our b object already saved the result of our mean function, let's pass b instead of it. I will print c so we can see the result. And there you go, same result and a much lighter code. And if you want to do the calculations with different data, you just need to update A. Like this. And then we run this selection. Nice! Ok, let's wrap it up here everybody. In the next lesson we'll get right back into functions and learn about the arguments of a function. Hey everybody, welcome back! We wrapped up the previous lesson with the promise of talking about arguments here and that's exactly what we'll do. Functions can take more than one argument, and in fact most of them do. You can discover what arguments a function takes by typing args and the name of the function in the parentheses, like this. Run the line and R tells us that round takes x, the data you're applying the function to, and digits as an optional argument. You will recognize optional arguments by the fact that they have a default value set for them. In this case, the default for the round function is 0 digits after the decimal point, but we can specify for example to round up to 2 digits after the decimal. All we need to do is enter the argument and set the number we want. And if we follow the order in which arguments are laid out in a function, we can even omit the argument name. Like this. See, we get the same result. Hum. So, you might ask why use arguments names at all if we can save ourselves the typing in R would still know what we're asking of it. Well, because things don't really work quite that way. The more arguments you enter, the higher the chance that the order in which you enter those arguments and their R order will not align. If they are misaligned, R will pass the wrong values to the wrong argument. Right. But if you choose to type out the argument name, this will be prevented. Since you're explicitly telling R what to do, it will always match the value to the argument name. This way, you can enter arguments in whatever order you want. For example, see? No error. Now, if you hadn't specified the argument name, but you had still followed this particular ordering, R would have thought that 2 is your data, whereas the actual value you're interested in rounding will be interpreted as the optional argument digits after the decimal point. Alright, great. This will do for now. We now know about the basics of objects and functions. 
Next, we'll try to be a bit like the people with the big brains, remember those guys, and build a function all by ourselves. And before we go, here's another puzzle for you. How do pirates know that they're pirates? Spend a minute on it, and I'll see you in the next lesson. So, how do pirates know they're pirates? Well, they think, therefore they are. Right. In the previous video, we opened the door to functions in R. Here, we will try to build a very simple function that will let us draw cards from a deck. If you are as much of a fan of board games as I am, you ought to have heard of Coup. It's a tiny, card-based game of deception, excellent for parties or small gatherings. You play the game by drawing character cards from a deck with a size 15. There are only five possible characters you can choose and each is repeated three times in the deck. Fair warning, I will augment the rules a little bit for this lesson so everything works like I want it to. Because you need to draw three cards at the beginning of the round, you may end up with three identical characters. Each character has a special quality that you can use to defeat your opponent, and since nobody but you knows which cards you drew, you can lie about having a character in your possession. The characters are the Duke, the Assassin, the Captain, the Ambassador, and the Contessa. Right, this information will suffice for building our card drawing function, and if you want to learn a little bit more about Ku, you can find the link to more information in the resources for the lesson. Okay. First, we need a deck. We already know how to make character vectors, which is exactly what we need in this case, so let's create a vector with all five characters. Fantastic. Let's check if everything is okay by printing our deck. Okay, we have all five characters lined up in here. Now, let's draw three cards from it. There is a function that helps us do that. It's called sample, and it takes two arguments. As usual, the data you want to sample from and the number of elements you want to sample, called size. Let's see if this works. I want to draw three cards from our deck, so I will type sample deck size equals three. From what we have learned about functions so far, you know that you can omit the name of the size argument if you want, and as long as you place your value where R has ordered the argument in the function, you will be okay. Okay, let's run that. Great, we got three different characters. But aren't we forgetting something? We might be forgetting that each character is repeated three times in the deck, so in a real game, we may end up getting up to three identical characters when we draw three cards. Okay, let's sample our deck a few more times and see if this will happen at all. Just rerun the line we have several times. Nope, no, we don't get any repeating characters. Huh. Okay, I know why this happens. This happens because the function is actually prohibiting repetition by default. Sample takes a third optional argument, actually, and it's called replace. To understand replace, imagine the following. You are drawing cards from a hat. You have lost all other cards from your deck apart from the five characters. So, you don't have any cards that are repeating. To play the game, you have decided that the best practice would be to draw a card, write down the character you got, then return the card to the hat and draw again. This repeats until you build your hand of three characters. So, even though cards are missing from your deck, you still get the chance to draw identical characters. Well, what the default setting of replace does is to set aside any character you draw so you cannot draw it again. This is avoided easily by changing the value of replace to true instead of its default false. This way, it will return any sampled characters back into the hat and you would be able to draw the same characters out again. Okay, let's try setting replace to true. I'll go back to the sampling function and just add replace equals as the third argument with a value of true. Run that for a couple of times. And there you have it, there it is, now you can get repeating characters. Fantastic. Okay, let's save this result to a variable called hand. Now when I call hand, it will give me the result of our sampling function. Let's try that. There you go, it works. Excellent. Well, 
you can give yourself a very, very good pat on the back because you just coded your way through your first R simulation. Good job. Okay, let's try and just get a different hand. Go hand again. Oh, it's the same values as before. Okay, maybe go hand again one more time. No. Okay, I think we have a problem. Every time I call hand, it gives me the same characters I drew initially. This is because R doesn't rerun the sample function every time we call hand. Okay, I see what's happening. We have given hand a set of values. That's the result of the first time we ran sample. And this is what it stores. It will not change, no matter how many times we call it. Okay, so what do we do to get past this? That's right, we will create a function called draw that will sample three characters from the deck every time we call on that function. This isn't scary at all, I promise. In fact, you can think of functions as just another type of object in R, but instead of data, they contain an R command. Does that make sense? Great. Right, so the architecture of a function is simple. It needs a name, a body of code, and arguments. Because we are in the very beginning, I will not burden you with too much information about arguments, but let's look at the body of the code, that's important. To build a function, we will use the function function. It looks like this. Draw, that's the name we want our function to have, less than, minus, function, parentheses, followed by braces, we also call that curly brackets. Once we fill out the space between the braces with code, calling draw will execute whatever body of code we've given the function. Pretty simple, right? Let's try it. So, we want our function to create our deck of cards each time we call it, then we want it to sample three cards from it with the possibility of repetition. All we need to do then is just collect the scattered pieces of code to do those individual actions and place them inside the braces. Like this. This creates our deck, the samples from it, and let's just add a line that says print hand so we see what we actually drew. Check if everything is enclosed within the curly brackets. It is fantastic. Okay, let's run this selection first so we create the draw function itself. All right, it's already in our environment. Great. Let's call on it a couple of times and see if it works. Don't forget that this is a function, so to execute it, you actually need to call it with the empty parentheses after the name, like this. If you don't add those parentheses, R will just output the code as it is defined in the function. And uh, not super useful. But our draw function works like a charm. Really, really excellent work, everybody. All right, you did your first simulation and you created your first function today. That is huge stuff. Next time we revisit the topic of constructing a function, we will talk about arguments and everything will be a lot more advanced. Keep the excitement going and don't forget to practice with the exercises for this section. It will really, really make things sink in. All right, so far I have been switching between writing code in the console and writing code in the script. There is a reason for this. You may have noticed already, but the console is excellent for easy one-line code and getting the quick result. However, we used the script when we were constructing our card drawing function. Care to guess why? Right, we used the script there because we were starting to build up too much code. This is when the console gets a little bit cramped, whereas the script can remain tidy and clean. Which brings me to the point of this lesson. The three main reasons to switch to using the script editor as your primary coding place. Reason number one, the script is durable. If saved and backed up, you would be able to access the code you wrote today in 10 years time. Assuming the internet doesn't crumble, that is. There are two approaches you can have to saving scripts. They can be pure storage spaces where you can put the code you have tinkered with in the console and are certain now works, or you can do the experimenting in the script, write comments to keep yourself on track, and delete the pieces that don't work, again, keeping only the good parts. Reason number two. Code is very, very easy to execute in the script. All you need to remember is that control or command plus return executes a code statement. 
It doesn't matter if the statement is a one-liner or a larger piece spanning five lines, when your cursor is on any of the statement's lines and you press Ctrl or Command and return, R will run the whole statement for you. And after executing, it will place the cursor at the beginning of the next statement. Basically, you can run your entire script in several successive Ctrl or Command plus returns. Or by running the source, which I mentioned in the RStudio overview lesson, if you remember. That was Ctrl plus Shift plus S. Right? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, we're down to reason number three for using the script. The editor marks syntax errors obvious by underlining the problematic pieces of code, and it tries to let you know about any possible future errors your code may cause. Whatever the case, R indicates the error by flashing a small symbol in the sidebar. A cross for syntax errors, and an exclamation point for possible sources of conflict later. Overall, using the script editor is a lot safer and user-friendly, especially for the beginner R head. Alright, that's it. Hope you found this useful, and I will see you in the next lesson.